If any event defines the Bruja's departure from the Camarilla, it must be the Conclave of Prague. Theo Bell, the Archon who had served the sect for over a hundred years, punctuated his clan's departure in a permanent and irrevocable way. Yet before this fateful conclave, Theobel was considered one of the most ardent supporters of the Camarilla who, despite his own political leanings, served faithfully despite mockery and ridicule from those who had forsworn the sect. While he had originally been appointed Archon under his sire Don Cerro, such was his reputation for efficiency and loyalty that Jaroslav Pajek, the Bruja appointed Justicar in 1998 after Zerro stepped down, kept him in his retinue. But long before that, in the early 1800s, Theo was born Theophilus to a family of slaves in a pre-Civil War plantation in the state of Mississippi. Theo grew up to work the cotton fields with his mother, his father, and his siblings. Conditions were rough, yet Theo's father was a large, strong man to whom laughter and mirth came easily, and he would do his utmost to ensure that, to the best of his ability, his family would be safe. Yet all this was taken away from the young Theo as, on his fifth birthday, his family was split up and half of them, Theo included, were sold to the Bell Plantation, far from where they currently were. Theo's father, however, would remain behind, and the heartbroken Theo clung to his father's legs until one of the men operating the slave auction pried him away. The young boy cried for the last time that day, and he saw his father's tears as well, weeping for the first time that Theo could remember. Master Bell, Theophilus's new owner, was a despicable man who would often force himself upon his female slaves, who could do nothing to protect themselves, lest they raise his anger. Theo likewise had to wring his hands in futility, knowing that he would be killed if he raised his hands against his owner. Theo would grow up to resemble his father in size and strength, yet he had not inherited his father's smile and he would remain deep in his thoughts for most of the time he spent on the plantation, dreaming of wrapping his hands around the owner's neck and squeezing the life out of him. Upon his mother's death from illness, a sickness no doubt given to her by the plantation's owner, Theo had had enough and he enacted a plan that he had concocted over many years. In the dead of night, he left the plantation and ran north, knocking a man unconscious and strangling a bloodhound that had been sent after him. As soon as he had found safety, he promptly joined the underground railroads and went back south to free as many slaves he thought would manage the hardships of the escape all the while dodging the wrath of the plantation owners who roared for his head. One night, during a mission that had gone painfully wrong, Theo, who was suffering from several wounds, was accosted by a stranger in the night. Theo, despite his exhaustion, tried to defend himself against a white, well-dressed man, but found himself outmatched, held immobile in his hands. Don Cerro was his name, and he offered Theo immortality as he had been impressed by the former slave's zeal and force of will. Theo was doubtful, but as his will wavered, he realized what he could do with the power offered. He accepted, on the condition that Don Cerro allowed him to return to the Bell Plantation. Don Cerro relented, and Theo was reborn into the night. When he had learned enough about his new kind to make it on his own, he returned to his former owner, equipped with a black snake whip. He took out all his anger and frustration on the old man until nothing remained of him but a wet red smear. Theo does not remember what happened during the rest of that night, but he woke up in the ruins of the slave quarters, piles of bodies around him, broken and tossed aside like toys. His old master's house was burning and Theo saw to his horror the faces of his siblings amongst the dead, killed by his own hands. Unable to weep, Yet overcome with grief, Theo ran from the scene, swearing that he would never forget where he had come from, no matter how powerful he would get. He took the name Bell to constantly remind himself of what he had paid for his vengeance. Until the end of the Civil War, Theo and Don Cerro remained in the Americas, his sire wanting Theo to learn as much as he could of being a scholarly warrior, tutoring him in the old ways of the clan. Yet he also allowed his child some leeway and the fledgling 
and the fledgling honed his skills by continuing to aid the underground railroads as well as, when the war between South and North raged, conducting raids on supply depots of the Confederate, all in a fruitless attempt to compensate for the dark deeds he had done at the Bell Plantation. After the end of the Civil War, Bell and Don Zero began to travel Europe as his sire wanted to introduce the young Bruja to the high society of the Camarilla. Unsurprisingly, Theo Bell soon found the company of these socialites highly unbearable, yet the loyalty he held for his sire, whom he perceived almost as a father figure at this point, tempered him and he showed the princes, the primogen and others the respect they demanded. He, in turn, was held as a novelty, a black man in a court of mostly white Europeans, and the way they looked at and treated him served only to remind Theo of his previous owners and his friends. During their time in London, Bell found that he had much more in common with the exploited working class than he did with the court of Mithras, and he would take any opportunity he could find to mingle with the common folk. Yet Don Cerro was growing influential in the Camarilla, to whom he was an utterly loyal and devoted member of, and Theo found that he could not, and did not even want, to leave his sire's side during all of this. One may perhaps wonder where this surprising loyalty came from, for while Don Cerro had given Theo the power to finally become his own man, the child clung to his sire's side through thick and thin. Few things can sway a man's convictions quite as extremely, and with Cerro's death we may never know the truth of the matter. But we are getting ahead of ourselves. The 1900s would turn out to be an eventful time for the two, and both sire and child returned to the Americas. Theo had kept a close eye on the reconstruction and had found it sorely lacking, the black populace of America free on paper, yet continuously oppressed and mistreated. Bell would perhaps have seen himself involved with the matter more personally, yet he was growing old to the point of having trouble relating to the issues of mortals, as his sire involved him more and more in the political turmoil of the kindred. Even so, Theo Bell would still keep tabs on the descendants of some of his relatives, as well as occasionally going down to the southern states to try to fight Jim Crow, the laws enforcing racial segregation. In the 1950s, the inner circle appointed Don Cerro to the position of Justicar, and naturally Bell became an Archon. In fact, the council had hoped for this, as it was the younger Bruja's knowledge of the Anarch movement and mortal civil rights circles that enticed them. Perhaps they had expected Bell to rebel, and maybe that was even their goal, but he did not. In fact, despite his Anarch leanings, not once did the newly appointed Archon break against the edicts of his superiors, following their words to the letter. In the 90s, his expertise was well known not just in America, but across the vampiric world. The Anarchs would refer to him as Killa B, or Lapdog, depending on how cocky they felt and how far away Theo Bell had last been sighted. Theo's successes won him the inner circle's personal accolades several times, and the Sabbat war packs all knew to fear him, the war over New York having cemented his reputation. In 1999, the Camarilla launched an offensive against the Sabbat of the city, who had long fought the self-proclaimed Prince Michaela over their territory. Theo Bell was appointed Praetor, a Camarilla position of command during a siege that outranks other Archons which surprised many as it was assumed that Justicar would lead these important efforts. Theo Bell employed a vast network of mortals during the day, weakening Sabat strongholds sufficiently that his forces could then mop up the rest during the night, and this tactic won him many victories. Eventually the Sabat were routed, the recently appointed Cardinal Francisco Domingo de Polonia, who had been the Archbishop of New York before that, fleeing as well, but not before he managed to decapitate Michaela. During this time, Theo Bell also had a run-in with the creature that had once been Leopold, the wielder of the Eye of Hazimel. Despite his skill and prowess, and the allies at his side, the Archon was unable to defeat the crazed artist, and it was only with the distraction provided by Leopold's muse that he could be laid low. Shortly after this, in the early years of the new millennia, Theo Bell would come upon evidence of a vampiric slave trade that would collect varied kind and kindred and sell them to the highest bidders a modern slave ring funded by powers within the Camarilla with infernalist roots. While investigating this, Bell would ask his sire to help him, bringing the former Justicar out of retirement. 
yet Don Cerro would be killed by the Camarilla warlord Karsh, who, in turn, would be staked and thrown in the Atlantic Ocean by Bell and Xaviar, the former gangrel Justicar, who was helping Theo in his investigations. Disillusioned by the Camarilla, Theo Bell's faith in the system began to weaken. He would then occasionally be seen in Washington DC, where he would meet with Marcus Vittel, a La Sombra anti-tribute disguising himself as Ventru and ruling over the city as his prince. Which was surprising since Vittel was purportedly destroyed by Bell after he, Jan Peterson, and several other kindred attacked Vittel, Bell having supposedly delivered the killing blow with the sword of Chris of Romwald, another Bruja attacking the La Sombra. Yet clearly Vettel was not dead, having survived the attack and further deciding to declare himself the Emperor of Washington DC, free from both Sabat and Camarilla rule. Similar in a sense to the British Isles once ruled by Mithras and the Anarch Free States of the West Coast. It is unknown what role Bell has played in this plan, if any, yet the Archon has not attempted to kill the La Sombra again, despite this knowledge. Ultimately, we find ourselves once more at the Conclave of Prague in 2012. Here, Theo Bell knelt before Hardestet, the founder of the Camarilla, before decapitating the Elder Ventru with a sawed-off shotgun, declaring that Clan Bruja would no longer serve under the Ivory Tower. John Peterson is as well said to have been killed by Bell before the former Archon departed the Conclave, his fellow rabble having descended upon the other present kindred. What was the reason for this betrayal? Was it the death of his sire at the hands of the Camarilla's warlord? The inner circle's lack of concern over the slave trade? Was his loyalty to the ivory tower because of a blood bond that had snapped with his sire's departure? Or did Vitell offer the Bruja something tempting enough to sway his allegiance? Or did he tell him a secret so dark that the once loyal lapdog finally gave up on the Camarilla? We do not know, yet Theo Bell is now lauded by many Anarchs as a hero for what he did. Yet there are those who disagree, wondering if not his departure is another clever plan to bring a moderate into their folds, to infiltrate the Anarch movement and uproot it from within. The death of Hardestad might have been as permanent as that of Marcus Vittel. This video was brought to you by my patron Jokerman. Thank you very much for your support, and I hope it was to your expectations. Now be careful out there, for Gehenna may soon be upon us.